Hi everyone, I'm Kevin from Travel by Numbers. If you're new here, my partner Sean and I have been documenting our travels over the last five years or so, and of course we welcome new subscribers. So yeah, it was cancer. Those of you who have been following our channel would already know that I had alluded to some health issues in a previous video. At that stage, I was still recovering, but I didn't explain the circumstances. More than two and a half years have passed since the diagnosis, and I've had time to think about whether I would open up about my challenges or should we just keep it to ourselves. But as cancer is, alarmingly, on a significant rise, I thought it best to relay my experiences in the hopes that it helps someone else facing this dreadful disease. Note that I'm not a doctor and uh, I have no medical training. This is uh, simply a first person account of an actual cancer diagnosis and subsequent treatments. If you or someone you know has had colorectal cancer, you may find the content of this video helpful. And also note, every person is different in their diagnosis and subsequent treatment regimen. The remedy I was provided might not be suitable for someone in a similar but not identical situation, and timing may also differ. Also, treatment availability and assistance might well be different in your country. We are in Canada, in one of the most urban areas of this country, where treatment facilities and programs are plentiful and generally free to access. But do take responsibility for your health and advocate for your own health care. Follow the advice of professionals. Educate yourself on issues you face. This episode will obviously be quite different from others from our travel seasons. You'll notice the distinct lack of color in favor of monochromatic imagery, more suited to the dark nature of the subject matter discussed here. And if you've seen any of our previous videos, you will know that I sometimes write the music used in our episodes. If you are facing recovery time, having one or more hobbies that you can enjoy indoors, uh, will provide rewards and a sense of worth in an otherwise difficult time. Whether it's songwriting, painting, blogging, or even working part-time, you step closer to the familiar, the way things used to be, your normal self. It's important because after being thrust into the deepest unknown providence, reclaiming your identity becomes paramount. Today then, no surprise, I'm coming to you from my recording studio at home. I had thought about doing this from various places out in nature, but logistically, as you will learn, that quickly becomes problematic. I'll start this story back in the early summer of 2021. I was 61 years old, healthy, and only on one medication for hypertension, otherwise known as high blood pressure. I had been getting a colonoscopy every five years because various cancers were and are rampant in my extended family, and it seemed a good way to hopefully ward off any signs of colorectal cancer. Sometimes they find and remove polyps, which might otherwise grow to a cancerous state. As you know, this is a travel channel, but we haven't been able to go on very many adventures these past few years. First of all, of course, COVID shattered most plans people may have considered, and restrictions endured throughout the pandemic. Just like everybody else, we miss traveling to new places and discovering unfamiliar cultures, but as older adults, the risk would have been too high. And of course, there was a lot back then that we didn't know about COVID or the vaccines that were being provided. We just saw people getting very sick and a lot of people dying. Having said that, I hope you've had a chance to watch our Halifax series. That was our first time on Canada's East Coast, our first domestic trip since COVID, and as you will learn later, a very difficult trip for me personally, although 
it's not readily apparent in our episodes. And with more difficulty, we take our first international trip in April 2024. The five-year mark for my colonoscopy was actually at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020. So I was due to go to the hospital to have this procedure performed. But as we didn't know anything back then about the disease and as hospitals were overwhelmed with the sick, it was the last place that I wanted to visit. And so I delayed my colonoscopy for a year and a half until August 2021. And now a warning. I'm going to be very upfront and honest about the entirety of my health crisis and experience. Some of you may find this uncomfortable. I'm not talking in broad strokes here. This is raw insight into a cancer diagnosis and what happens afterward. If you are squeamish, you may want to have your finger on the mute button. I'll put a visual warning at the bottom of the screen like this to let you know when things are going to get particularly graphic and remove it when the coast is clear. Part 1. The Dreaded Diagnosis Colonoscopies are nothing to be afraid of. You've probably heard people say that the worst part of it is the preparation you have to do at home before going to have the procedure performed. It's not pleasant, but having the procedure itself done, oddly, doesn't present any discomfort or pain. One is put to sleep, so you literally can't remember anything about it. And afterward, the nurses just tell you to pass gas, and then they let you go. So as I'd already had many colonoscopies performed, this was a familiar experience and not a big deal. And so off I went. After I woke up from the procedure, I was told to call my surgeon's office. Now, this is not unusual at the, as the nurses are not really allowed to tell you what, if anything, was found. So I wasn't alarmed by this request. I got an appointment two weeks later. Bad news, it seems, is portrayed in media, television, movies, and so on in a sort of stereotypical way. And I think we've come to expect that this is actually the way it plays out in real life. And in fact, sometimes it does. My first surgeon, the one that performed the colonoscopy, entered the small private patient room I was waiting in, looked at his computer screen for a minute, spun his chair toward me, leaned over and said, I'm sorry, I have some bad news. Now I can't say that I was prepared for the worst. I didn't know what the worst was. He said that they found something and sent a biopsy away to pathology and the results came back as stage two colorectal cancer or more specifically rectal cancer. There are four stages to cancer. Stage two indicates that the cancer has breached to the lymphatic system and therefore has had an opportunity to spread elsewhere in the body. This kind of news doesn't sink in right away and not even in the hours afterwards. I don't even know when the gravity of the situation revealed itself. I'm a practical person, so I guess I just thought, well, I'll just do everything that they tell me to do and hope for the best. I think for the most, uh, or for most people, cancer is just a word because most genuinely don't conceptually understand the breadth or scope of what that word means. Similarly, most don't understand the weight of the word battle, often used in reference to cancer. One in 13 men and one in 16 women will develop colorectal cancer at some point in their lifetime. But even this statistic will worsen as cases have been on the increase. Your best defense against a colorectal cancer diagnosis is regular colonoscopies. This cancer diagnosis then 
triggered a very quick healthcare response. The remedy would occur in three parts, chemotherapy and radiation treatment, surgical removal of the cancerous tumor, and provision of an ileostomy bag. This is the first major surgery. And finally, an ileostomy reversal, the second major surgery. And if you don't know what any of this means, you're going to be an expert, sort of, by the end of this episode. I should mention up front here that all of my procedures were performed at a local and very well-equipped cancer center. I was provided with a chemotherapy oncologist, a radiation oncologist, two primary nurses, a pharmacist who would provide the chemo drugs and check in with me weekly, a radiation team, a mental health therapist, nutritionist, and an intimacy therapist. Don't let that last one surprise you. When surgery is performed near the pelvic floor, at least for men, sexual function is one of the few things that can be, let's just say, altered. The uh, bladder can also be affected too. On a side note, given that we are in Canada, I think it's fairly common knowledge elsewhere that we have a pretty decent healthcare system here and that there is generally no cost incurred for most. All services provided by the Cancer Center were free to me, including a multitude of CT scans and MRIs, visits with the nurses, doctors, oncologists, the surgeries, operating room fees, multiple and extended hospital stays, and therapists. I have a drug plan through work, so my entire expenditure throughout this multi-year ordeal was a single $6 dispensing fee for a prescription not handled by the cancer center itself. Even the daily nursing visits to our home were gratis. There were no co-pays. Some costs may not be covered though, depending on such factors as enrollment in an enhanced healthcare plan, usually through work or via a pension after retirement, and living location, among other things. I don't mean to imply that everything is free all of the time for everybody because it isn't. And healthcare is a provincial slash territorial offering here in Canada, so services differ depending where one lives. But healthcare is an ongoing priority for all provincial slash territorial governments in this country, and we as citizens contribute to healthcare costs through various taxes. So I tried to figure out what all of my services would have cost me, but hard costs are not readily available here in Canada. But a According to the uh, AARP in the United States, the average cost of a cancer diagnosis and treatment there is $150,000 US, but can be higher or lower depending on the circumstances. You can understand then how the financial burden can be just as devastating as the diagnosis itself in countries that by default do not assume most healthcare costs for their citizens. Part two, chemotherapy and radiation. So just a few weeks after diagnosis, I was back at the hospital getting a CT scan for the purposes of marking my body with four permanent tattoos using laser guides and imaging that would then be used to reproduce my exact body alignment in the radiation units such that the beam would be precisely directed at the tumor. I then started a 28-day regimen of chemotherapy and radiation treatment, which actually stretched out to a month and a half because they give you weekends and statutory holidays off. That would come to be a tremendous blessing. 
I took a photo of myself every time I went in. I don't know why, really. Maybe it was just proof of life or something, or a record of accomplishment. Maybe I'm just a thoroughly modern man taking selfies like a 13-year-old schoolgirl. These are actual photos of me in one of the radiation units, and you can see the lasers used for triangulation. The machine moved around my body 360 degrees. It can also do CT scanning, which they did about every other session. The sessions were short, probably 10 minutes on average, and you get used to the noises the machine makes, so it becomes easy to figure out when you're almost done. You don't feel anything while undergoing radiation treatment. You are already hurting from previous sessions, and this will just add to that. So the goal was to shrink the tumor, which in my case was located just a few centimeters in from my anus. It might be helpful at this point to show you an image courtesy of the Mayo Clinic. This shows the colon, rectum, and anus and approximates where the tumor was discovered, if not just a little lower. Above this section of the digestive system is the small intestine and before that the stomach. The lower rectum is probably the worst place to have a tumor because in some cases there's not enough room to operate and still retain all of the functionality of the sphincter. In that extreme case, they remove the tumor and, through extensive surgery, effectively close up the back end in favor of a colostomy bag. It's an extremely drastic operation and apparently quite painful in recovery. Your solid human waste exits continuously into a bag on your abdomen. I was very nearly in that situation, which for me, added additional anxiety to an already dire diagnosis. Chemotherapy, for me, was a regimen of five highly toxic pills in the morning and five more in the evening. I had to use my own washroom. I was ordered to wash my hands diligently and flush the toilet twice every time I used it. In the event Sean was to come in contact with any of my bodily fluids and to protect himself, he had to wear non-latex rubber gloves. The very dangerous drugs kill bad and good cells in the body indiscriminately. And as I don't do well in being able to tolerate many drugs, I had some significant anxiety there too. For me, even five weeks of low-dose aspirin or acetylacetic acid, otherwise known as ASA, will result in adult RISE syndrome, for instance, which affects all major organs in my body in a march towards death. It took me nine awful months to recover from that lesson. But to my amazement, I had no negative reaction to the chemo. No nausea, really no side effects, save some mild dry skin on my hands and feet. This is common and called hand and foot syndrome, but can usually be controlled through frequent use of a high quality moisturizer. I used one upon recommendation called Utterly Smooth, originally developed for cow udders, but renowned for its ability to prevent drying, cracking and weeping of skin affected by toxic chemo drugs. The drugs, though harmful in many ways, support the radiation efforts. Without them, the radiation wouldn't be as effective. The first 10 radiation sessions went off without a hitch and I felt pretty good. But after that, the radiation unit staff started to ask me if I was feeling anything, and I was. I knew something was going on back there. Things quickly got much more painful as the radiation compounded session after session. I dreaded the daily and somewhat bumpy drive to the cancer center. And remember, you can't stop a beam. 
Due to the unimaginable events in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Chernobyl, I think we're all at least slightly aware of what radiation does to the human body. And in my case, mild but painful radiation burns appeared in the crack of my buttocks, internally in my rectum, and also at the front of my body where the beam exited. And with regard to what you're thinking now, well, the beam hit that too. And there was temporary collateral damage to my prostate and bladder. Mind, these burns are not like what you see in the movies or authentic photos of radiation victims. What I didn't know is that there is literally no oral drug that can, one can take uh, for pain relief in the areas where I was getting radiation treatment. If I was in the hospital, <clears throat> I would probably be put on a hydromorphone drip, but no over-the-counter or readily obtainable non-prescription oral drug behind the counter at the pharmacy, like Tylenol 2, will ta target pain in the area where I was having it. Nurses, doctors, surgeons, pharmacists all told me the same thing. So I was left writhing in pain in bed for up to seven hours a day, the latter half of my radiation sessions. In fact, when the sessions were finally completed and I rang the survivor bell, the radiation, thanks to its half-life, still compounds day after day and results in ever-increasing worse pain for up to a week after the last session. In my case, day six after completion was my most painful day, and then things noticeably and steadily improved. One often reads about cancer patients using cannabis to help alleviate pain. I've never been a recreational drug user, but as cannabis use is legal across Canada, once I had recovered enough to leave the house for a moment, Sean and I went to a local store and I bought two types of gel caps that didn't alleviate pain for me, but went a long way to suppressing the anxiety associated with the recovery process. A 5 plus 5 milligram CBD and THC gel cap for nighttime use and a 10 milligram CBD for daytime use. These would also become necessary post ileostomy reversal, which I'll talk about later in this video. A person with a higher tolerance for cannabis products may need a higher dose, but for me, 5 milligrams was enough and at the time was the highest single dose allowed to be legally sold. One could always double up if they needed to anyway. The capsules were cheap, like about $1.25 each, but offered exponentially more uh, value in the uh, relief. I spent many, many days in bed watching training videos on a host of interesting subjects. Our golden retriever, Heath, also joined me, and when I could sit for short periods, I started learning Apple's Motion, an application that makes it easy, sort of, to build plugins for Final Cut Pro, the nonlinear editor I used to build the episodes you see on our channel. You would have seen the result of this effort in our Halifax series. The red info bar at the bottom of the screen, the slide out info panel, and sliding panel and video recentering were all custom plugins I created. If nothing else, it kept my mind off my medical issues, sort of a distraction. We often hear people comment on others who have battled cancer, and yet it's often not the cancer itself that one battles, it's the treatments. And thank goodness we have the treatments. And while you might judge the next two sections of this video to be the most medically challenging. In fact, it was the radiation that posed the greatest harm, the most pain, and in some ways the longest recovery, as side effects can linger for up to two years. But for now, I just had a short time to recover before the surgeons removed my tumor. It was now October 2021, and I had one more scan to get, which would reveal the success or not of the treatments. Part three, first major surgery.
What I didn't tell you about in the last section of this video is that all the while I was trying to cope with the chemo radiation combo, I was having extremely painful episodes sourced high up on my rib cage. And yet another trip to the hospital and another scan, it was determined that my gallbladder was heavily diseased. Anyone with gallbladder pain experience will absolutely cringe at the thought. And remember, everything that's been happening so far has been going on in the early days of the pandemic. But as my cancer surgery was already scheduled and the surgeons wouldn't perform two major operations on me within a span of three months, all I could do was visit the emergency department and get a liquid pain reliever called a Pink Lady, a shot of morphine in one arm, and a shot of Dramamine or anti-nausea in the other arm, and another medication whose purpose escapes me right at this moment. You have to laugh though because sometimes life just keeps piling on challenges one on top of another, almost as if to test you to see what you're made of, to see if you can take it. I tell people now that my challenges throughout the last two plus years pale to those assumed by my partner of 31 years, Sean. Just having a caregiver is a supreme blessing, as many cancer patients I met at the radiation units were completely alone, with some living in more, rep more remote parts of this massively uh, large province. But for all the while I was in the hospital or otherwise incapacitated at home, and even sometimes now in 2024, Sean has had to assume some or all of the household duties, plus visit me in the hospital, run errands, walk our dog three times a day, buy groceries, pay bills, and tend to my needs. It was and is a huge burden physically and mentally. Anyway, great results from the chemo radiation. The tumor had shrunk to effectively a scar. The first surgery was on the books for early January 2022 when Ontario had its once every 10 years snowstorm. I don't recall having to mentally prepare for the surgery. I had been to the hospital so many times at this point, and in fact, over 50 times over the two year period I cover in this video, that I was completely at ease. They make you comfortable at every turn, so nothing scary was looming. Intubation, tube insertion, and other medical procedures were performed after I was anesthetized. The surgery itself was to be about seven and a half hours with two surgeons, one operating laparoscopically through six openings in my abdomen and one operating transanally. This might be a good time to use the mute button if you need it. One surgeon gingerly removed my rectum in which the tumor resided and connected my colon directly to a point just inside my anus using titanium staples. Now as that new connection needed time to heal, the other surgeon brought about one and a half inches of my small intestine outside of my body and created two holes in it so that they could install an ileostomy bag over it. This is similar to a colostomy bag in that your semi-solid human waste exits your body into a bag, but obviously much earlier in the digestive process. Initially, and occasionally at other times in the recovery process, the waste was drained into a much larger bag hanging off the side of the hospital bed. And while I recovered, I had to learn to replace the bag and flange using a mock-up model before I could do it to myself. Everything went smoothly during the operation, and in fact, my vitals were so strong that they were able to add another hour to the operation and remove my diseased gallbladder. I was actually more happy about that than the tumor removal because it was the gallbladder that was causing me a lot of pain, not the cancer. Post-surgery, they had me on a hydromorphone drip. This is a derivative of morphine, but cleaner. 
I was in control of the administration, but of course there was an electronic limiter so I wouldn't overdose. A couple of days after the surgery, one of the nurses asked my pain level from 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst. I said 3. The next day I was 2.5, and, and the next 2. I began winding down my use of the drug to an eventual stop because I really didn't need it. It's very important to manage pain right up front, and I get that, and I did that, but I wasn't in pain at this point. Of course, they had me up walking the halls right away. My IV bags were on wheels, so I had to push that in front of me. They called me a racehorse because I was going so fast, but I was also losing weight. For the first 12 days post-operation, I was only allowed to have ice chips. That's it. I lost 24 pounds during that period, and 20% of my body weight, 52 pounds, throughout this entire process. And I can tell you, if there's one thing that you quickly forget once deprived, it's how food tastes. Things you don't even like suddenly become extremely appetizing. In my case, cherry flavored ice cream. Sean ensured there was a liter of it awaiting me in the freezer at home. I was in the hospital longer than the expected five to seven days, but I had two separate setbacks. You may know that the gallbladder creates bile to help digest food, but even without it, the stomach also creates bile, and this was not exiting my body through the ileostomy bag. It was building up, building up in my stomach until the abdomen swelled up, kind of like a beached whale. So they put in an NGT tube, or nasogastric tube, through my nose and into my stomach to drain and keep draining the contents. Subsequently, after an alternative hypertension drug reaction, I lost 2.5 liters of body fluid within two hours which could have led to crashing, and so they quickly pumped four bags of saline solution into my arm as fast as the machine would run. After that episode, I got permission to use my own hypertension drug instead of the one the hospital supplied. Eventually, they would switch me to a liquid diet and then soft food and solid food before finally letting me go home. No one ever raves about the hospital food. It's bland and salt-free, and that was the case here. Anyway, I would return and be admitted twice due to blockages in my small intestine. And again, press mute if you're squeamish because the next paragraph is absolutely horrific. I had a small intestine blockage at home, which I was instructed to carefully attempt to clear with Sean's help using a rubber catheter tube we inserted directly into the ileostomy. Nothing says I love you like helping your spouse insert a catheter into their small intestine. These are things that nightmares are made of, right? It was terrible, but we were successful. You would be surprised what you would do to yourself to survive, and sometimes the remedy is worse than any horrors you might imagine. But it was a one and done experience. Would never do it again. So if any healthcare professional asks you to do that procedure yourself, the correct answer is no. All in all, I would spend 25 days in the hospital in this round. Every floor had COVID-19 patients. I saw nurses donning and discarding extra PPE over and over again. I saw staff shortages. I saw frustration and anger. But I also saw underpaid health workers try, even under extreme pressure and risk, to give the best medical service possible even at times with humor, while shielding patients from the reality just outside of their doors. You've seen them being called heroes. They were and 
R. Now normally when one is fitted with an ileostomy bag, which by the way is changed a couple of times a week and the flange once a week, it stays in place for around three months, but can stay in place longer. Obviously, the longer it's in place, the more time the colon has to heal, but you should familiarize yourself with the pros and cons. I had nurses come to visit me at home daily for the first few weeks, and then I backed it off to weekly, then every two weeks, as I became more self-sufficient in changing my ileostomy bag and flange. At that point, I just needed someone to check to make sure that my skin was okay. Covering skin for extended periods of time can cause other issues, uh, and itchiness was a constant. But I can tell you that the 15 minutes in the shower with no bag and no flange once a week was heaven, and it gave me an opportunity to shave around the ileostomy. The flange needs hairless skin in order to stick properly. You don't want leak leakage. I wore the bag for 10 and a half months, and then it was back to the hospital at the end of November 2022 for an ileostomy reversal. Part four, second major surgery. Okay, if you're using a mute button, uh, you may want to do so for about 20 seconds here. An ileostomy reversal, at least in my case, involved removing the ileostomy bag and flange, snipping out approximately 12 inches of my small intestine, joining the remaining ends, and closing the incision. This effectively reconnected all of my digestive plumbing, or what was left of it, again. The operation this time was about two hours in length. Most of the time during my hospital stays, I was in a semi-private room where I had one roommate, but about 30% of the time I was placed in a private room, which I appreciated. All of my roommates were nice, but sometimes the smells were unpleasant. And at one point I was sh uh, shifted with three other people into what was effectively a storage space for unused medical beds. The lighting was intermittent as if from a thriller movie. There were so many COVID patients that the hospital was running out of room to admit them. The nursing staff though made up for the unusual accommodation and tried to make us all as comfortable as possible. I was in the hospital for five days and then sent home to recover. I thought this final leg of the procedures would result in a relatively easy and perhaps short recovery, given everything I had previously been through, but I wasn't really expecting a significant quality of life change. Part 5 Recovery and Prognosis If you've made it this far, congratulations. You're starting to understand why our channel has been quiet all this time. It's not like we haven't been busy. I was told by my surgeon that whatever my condition was six months after the ileostomy reversal is how I would basically be for the rest of my life. So you might imagine my disappointment when literally nothing changed for the first five and a half months. I had no control of my bowels. I had frequency, urgency, and clustering of bowel movements. I would go number two, sometimes up to 30 times a day. All that cleaning was painful. I had to use barrier cream similar to what you might use on a baby, though a better grade medical version. There was no consistency, nor could I tell if and when I needed to go to the bathroom. The thing is, it is the rectum that contains a trigger to the brain to tell you that you need to start thinking about going to the bathroom at some point in the near future. This is because the rectum is basically full, 
But because that was removed for me, I don't have that trigger, or at least a clear trigger, that tells me it's safe to go out in public or to travel. Since it's now been about 16 months since my ileostomy reversal, I do have a few clues that help me determine what my status is and whether I might need to rush to an available bathroom. But an available bathroom is key here. I can't wait. I can't line up. I can't stop the inevitable. When your rectum is removed, you no longer have a storage facility for human waste. So it all makes its way through the small intestine and down to the colon. There's only one type of pain receptor contained in the colon, and that is one that senses stretching. So in my case, as my colon fills up with human waste, I start to get cramping in my lower abdomen and lots and lots of passing gas. If I don't pay attention to this, I'll be running to the nearest bathroom. And because I don't have storage, instead of emptying a relatively small amount of human waste in any one sitting, my body has to evacuate almost the entirety of my digestive system over a number of trips to the bathroom, usually somewhere in the 3 to 10 range. The average human has anywhere between 10 and 15 pounds of waste inside them at any given time. This is what my body has to evacuate before it eventually plugs up and gives me one or two days of relative relief. The other thing I'm left with are very strong anal spasms post bowel movement. These typically happen every five minutes or so for up to three hours. So you might wonder how I would get to sleep if I was having bowel movements close to bedtime, which sometimes does happen. Well, as I alluded to earlier, the cannabis gel caps I use also reliably relieve the spasms in about 15 minutes, and the THC component makes me sleepy. Apparently, some persons with multiple sclerosis also use cannabis products to reduce spasms, and I can see why. So that's the quality of life change, really. Trying to manage what is otherwise a natural biological process while having little to no control of the process itself. And as a result, I spend about 90% of my time inside our house and sometimes, and, uh, sometimes am able to make uh, quick trips to a grocery store or a bakery or walk our dog, so long as I think the risk is low. I do wear a diaper periodically though. Initially I was wearing them every day, but was able to get back to wearing underwear and switching to a diaper maybe once a month. This was a huge win for me because it brought a sense of normality to what is otherwise just a bizarre turn of life. But I will go back to a diaper if I'm having particular trouble with my bowels. There are many other smaller wins that are equally important. For a while there, it was seven steps forward and five steps back, so the value of small wins becomes increasingly uh, important uh, to hopefully a better quality of life. So the only way I'm able to leave the house for an extended period of time, for instance, a number of hours, is to make sure that I was emptied out on the previous day, and then the day that we plan to do something, I take Imodium to reduce the risk of having an accident, and I have had accidents. So again, knowing what you know now, if you've seen our Halifax series here on YouTube, you might be wondering how exactly I was able to manage a trip like that. If you've ever, ever had a colonoscopy, and if you're 45 years of age or older, you should have one every five years or earlier on doctor's advice. You will be familiar with the pre-colonoscopy preparation that you have to do at home. This involves drinking clear liquids only for 24 hours, taking a few laxatives, followed hours later by a drug that purges your digestive system. This is what I have to do pre-flight. And then the day of the flight, now empty, 
I go back on Imodium and stay on Imodium each day until about the third day, at which time I take a couple of laxatives to try and get rid of everything, and then back on Imodium until the day before we fly home, at which time I have to do the whole colonoscopy prep again and Imodium on flight day. Lots of work. Plus, I lose a whole day of our trip due to having to do this preparation. And I wear a series of diapers through the entire time I'm away from home. I also travel with an emergency kit in my vehicle and carry one on my back as we explore our destination. I don't like using drugs unless absolutely necessary, so I minimize the use of Imodium and laxatives outside of the times we travel. It's important to know that Imodium doesn't stop digestion. It just slows it down. So there's always a risk when taking it and then going out somewhere. Like me, you would have to get good at assessing risk when making plans to leave your home. I've had to race home a few times. Passing gas is also a huge problem for anyone who has had colorectal cancer. And it all comes down to diet, which I'm still learning. I can pinpoint certain foods that will cause me trouble, including broccoli, cauliflower, onions, and really any vegetables that are not cooked. Spicy food is also problematic, as well as fizzy drinks. The flatulence, though, also restricts social interaction, making it difficult to go to restaurants or other people's homes. So now that poop rules my life, you might wonder if I'm happy. And I am. In fact, I've saved some good news. Pathology on my tumor revealed that I was not stage two, but rather stage one, and the cancer had not breached the rectum wall. 17 lymph nodes were also removed and analyzed with no cancer center, or sorry, cancer cells found. Additionally, I go every six months for a cancer checkup, always with a carcinoembryonic antigens or otherwise CEA uh, blood test. And once a year, I get a CT scan. This will carry on for a period of five years, after which if nothing new shows up, they declare me cured. So far, my cancer markers are in the normal range, similar to an average person with no cancer. A normal person's number will be 3.1 or below. Uh, mine post-surgery was 3.1, 3.2, 2.6, .2, and now 2.8. We've all seen examples of humans adapting to extreme circumstances. And at the end of the day, I'm alive, I'm still able to write music, release albums, enjoy my photography and videography hobbies, and navigate the rest of life with Sean. There are still many adventures to be had and places to see, and we plan to do just that. Thanks for watching this personal interest story. Sean and I appreciate your patience and interest in our channel, and we'll continue to provide high quality episodes in the future, albeit a little more slowly. It'll always be a surprise when we post something and hopefully an enjoyable one. Thanks again. If you enjoyed today's episode, please click the like button. And by subscribing and turning notifications on, you'll help us create new content. Thanks for watching. And remember, experiences not things.